This information is brought to you by Charles Sturt University. Good morning, guys. So what we're going to look at today is um, counting. Um, now, <laughs> that does not mean uh, like you did in um, kindergarten or earlier, you've done one, two, three, four, etc. Uh, or kindergarten. Or kindergarten, hopefully, yes. Um, we are trying to count... Uh, bigger stuff than that require more than just using figure, um, and just so it's just looking at how to look at how many various options there are in different circumstances. That's basically, what I mean. so um, often you're deal coming with a problem, and you've got to work out how many different options are there. If the options aren't very many, you just try all options and go for it. Um, so, for example, you're doing computer vision. You want to work out um, what lines there are in the image. That might be an idea. So if there's not too many different lines that costly be, you just try them all out. Just try every single option. Just do a brute force effort, and you'll find out what they are or not. Some in a real in a real image, there's probably just too many, too many different lines, and so a brute force method won't work. You have to do something else. So what you do is you just randomly pick a few bunch of lines and get collections from that. So a randomised Hoff transform or something like that. So you, in knowing how many things there are, it affects what sort of algorithm you want to try to apply in that sort of problem. And that's all the biggest goal. So even if you're trying to be a hacker and trying to work out breaking passwords, how many password options are there to know what sort of approach to take, etc. Hopefully you're not that way inclined. But, um. So uh, just going back to the basics, um, there are sort of um, two basic principles to look at, um, the multiplication and the sum principles. Um, so if you've got M um, independent choices, so if you've got M choices for one event and M choices for a second event and they're independent of each other, and independent mean in the sense that they don't impact one or the other, so they have no relationship, then the number of choices is M times by N. And the word independent is hopefully what you think it to be. So, um, look at number plates. So, um, how many different number plates are to form a letter, 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 number, number, and a letter? How many different options are there? So, we want to know how to do it rather than what the final answer is. The A1 26 times 26 times 26. Yep. So um, we'll do it the, the slow way, and then we'll do the quick way, because it's probably good to do the other quick way. So there's 26 options for the first letter. Then each letter is independent of each other, that's what we're assuming. 26 for the next letter, 26 for the third letter. Um, how many from is getting a number? Uh, 10. 10 by 10 times by 26. So that's, it. that's just listing them all out. You can type in your calculator if you wanted to. Um, if you notice that the, all the it's four lots of 26 there, so you could group that together. It's 26 to the power of four, no, and there's two lots of two numbers, so it's 10 to the power of two. And you write that down straight away if you wanted to. So you can just go straight to the power option um, if that's quicker. So if there's four different A's, well that's going to be 26 to the power of four straight away. And whatever your calculator tells you is the answer essentially. So for today, um, did you know how to use that calculator to get that as a number? It's a serious question. Like, could you put a calculator and work that out as a number for me? Okay, so you know what buttons to press? Okay. Um, then we'll leave it at that, and that's more informed than everything else. So, um, how many different 8 bit words are there? And so, 8 bit words is, you know, an a binary number with eight digits in it, or a if you want to write it down, a hexadecimal number with two digits in it. Uh, how many different eight-bit words are there? Two to the eight. Okay, so you got each bit has two options to it. So each bit has two options, so it'd be two times by two times by etc. 
for eight, each of the different digits, or put it simply, it's um, two options for eight, each of the eight different um, digits. So two to the eight. Um, what is two to the eight equal to? Two to six. So it's got to be an even number. Um, so another option is um, an eight-bit word is basically, you know, two hex digits. Is what we learnt yesterday. I mean, you can write hex and decimal binary; they're just sort of interchangeable. So if it's hex digits, then there are um, how many different? Of each hex digit, how many different options are there? Fifteen, sixteen. Sixteen. You can give zero. So it's sixteen. How many times by sixteen? So 16 for the first one, 16 for the second one, or 16 squared for short, which is also equal to 256. It's the same answer either way. So just showing you the equivalence between hex and binary again. Um, but again, that's the idea of counting stuff. So um, this is another case um, which is also counting. So um, do you understand the notation that I've used here? It's C rather than anything else. Do you know what plus plus means? Yeah, increment. So what number would K be in? So in terms of our counting, we've got four loops, like they're just nested, so four nested loops there. How many times does the outermost loop run for? Now my question is, do you understand the four note? You know? So it's basically, it's doing a four loop, the variable starts at one, and it keeps going up to N1. It just jumps up one integer at a time, so it's just one, two, three, up to n1. So how many times the outer loop do? Well, n1 times. The next loop goes how many times? n2 times. And then one next time is n3, the next one's n4. And it just rattles them off. And every time, the, and what it does every single time is it just adds one to the K. So K is just a counting group, just a counter. And so what's K going to be at the end of it? Well, there's N times it does the outer loop. Within, with every iteration of that outer loop, it would do the next loop, which would be N2 times by something or other. Hmm? No, K oh, K's a counter. Yeah. So K is just counting. So what's K? So K would be just how many times the alliteration is done. So let's just... So if you do one lot, lot of that, the inner loop, basically it's just going to do that N four times. The next outer loop there, the every iter so that would do that, we'll do that loop this loop here, n three times. Every time it does that loop, it's doing this in loop one time each. So it'd be n three times by n four would be the number of times it does that. Lots of spinning around. The next loop around, well that would do it n times, but it's doing all the inside loops. Just get that number here times by n3, times by n1. So what's k going to be at the very end of it all? I haven't done the old one yet. So the biggest loop, you do it n1 time. So basically k is going to be n1 times by n2, times by n3, times by n4. So it does a lot of times, I guess that's the simple answer. So, um, 
that's a lot of times. That's still called um, tractable because it's at least a polynomial time. So, um, but still, not a lot of nested loops stuff slows you down, things down. So you're probably aware of. So really, you've got four independent loops effectively, just incrementing that counter. Um, and so. Good idea is just to understand how many it is. So often you make them all the same counter. So n1, n2, n3, n4 are probably all the same number, is often what you commonly do. So the end of the power of 4, for example. So that's the multiplication rule. So if you've got two independent things, just multiply the two numbers down if it counts. You can do sums. So if you've got um, a task that can be done one way or another, but, not, but they can't both happen, so it's one or the other, so it's really disjoint events. And in terms of annotation before, disjoint means the, the join, so A intersection, B is the empty set. That's what disjoint means in terms of annotation. Now you don't have to think about that, you can just say they don't occur together. So if you go to either one or the other, but not both, so it's an exclusive or, then if you've got N ways the first, N for the second, you just add them together. Um, so like a dice, for example, um, how many different ways are getting an odd digit on a six-sided dice? One out of two. And how many? I'm just counting. I'm doing probably for the moment. One, three. And There's three ways. Yep. So three ways. Doing. How many different ways are getting an even number? The same. So three. They are mutually exclusive, and so they can't happen at the same time. They're just completely disjoint from each other. And so the number of ways they're getting a, a number on a Dice is either three sides, three ways for the odd, or three ways for the add up. You know how to do that already without thinking about it, really. So it just makes sense, probably. I hope so. That's what we're trying to do. So, um, say uh, you've got a project at some point in time and you've got three different streams to pick from, you have to just pick one project. So, you pick your stream, and when you pick your stream, you pick your project. Uh, and the first stream has 23 options. Sex stream has 15, and the last one has 19 options. How many different choices do you have? So you pick a stream and then go pick a project. How many real choices do you have? So if you multiply, then that implies you choose one, say if you choose one from stream one, one from stream two, one from stream three, then yes, you would multiply them. But that's not what we're doing, you're just picking one, just one from all of the groups. So multiplication is not the right way in this case, because we're making just one selection. Really. So I'm trying to run the numbers. So 23, 15, and 19. So first of all, you have to pick one of these three options. You pick one of those three options. Now, if you pick stream one, you can't pick stream two at the same time, or stream three. So they're really disjoint choices, or if you just make one or the other, you can't make both. So since they're disjoint, the ways of counting one or the other or the other we just sums. So the total number of ways would be just add the three numbers together. Like effectively, if you add them up, so you're getting 40, 2, 57. So you've got 57 different projects in front of you, just go pick one of them. The fact that they've been grouped in three different groups doesn't really affect the fact there is still 57 to choose from at the end of the day. And when you're doing a lot of multiplications, a bit of a, you might think to that, you go, well, I only want to choose one. The grouping is just a irrelevant red herring, perhaps. OK, so um, another sort of choice one. So um, sometimes when you've got 8-bit words, um, some of the digits are often used to determine the type. So like a MAC address, top. Um, word of a MAC address, the bottom two digits, flags, what type of address it is. 
So if you know if you know that the last two digits have to be say one zero one one for example, so you've got one or the other, how many different eight word, bit words satisfying that are there? So let's think what the options are. So option number one would be you've got it's eight bits, so you've got six binary di bits, so the zeros or ones, with a z one zero. That's one choice. Or it can be six digits, so binary digits, so zeros or ones, followed by one one. So they're the two options that we're going to consider, essentially. How many different ways are there of each of them? So how many different options? So this will do number of ways now. So how many different ways are of getting the first option, this one here? So how many choices for the B are there? So it's going to be 2 times by 2, 6 times. So 2 to the 6 for short. How many different choices are there for the, this digit here? Just one, if you want to put it that way. Yep. And how many different choices are for the for 0? Just one. So you could just leave it out, really. So really, the only thing you have to really choose from is just the the first six digits. The other ones are just given to you, forced upon you, so you don't have much of a choice there. So really, there's two to the six different ways of choosing that first type. So what's two to the power of six again? 64. 64, yep. So let's do the other option. So the other option is uh, six bits followed by one one. How many different options are there for that one? So it's going to be the same for similar reasons. The choices are only in the first six bits. So it's still 2 to the 6. That's still 64. And what do you do with this 2 64s? Multiply them, add them, subtract them. Add them. Add them. Why do you add them? Yeah, because it's one or the other, but not both. Because they're disjoint. So if they had to overlap, then it's a lot more. Then you can't just simply add them. You have to do something trickier. But if they're simply disjoint, like they definitely are here, or they can't occur at the same time, since they're strictly disjoint, then we can just add them quite happily. So what's two lots of 64? 28. Okay, so you can do... So that just so you can do more advanced stuff, um, which really just... And all the advanced stuff really just extensions of what you've done. Hopefully, really, it's just special cases of it. So one is the using the idea of factorial. Um, so factorial is the number of ways of ordering n things. So n factorial is the number of ways of ordering n things. So for example, three factorial would be the number of ways of ordering three things. Um, ten factorial would be the number of ways of ordering ten things, etc. Um, a special case is zero factorial would be the number of ways of ordering nothing. And sort of by definition, there's nothing to order, so I guess there's only one way of doing it. So by definition, zero factorial is equal to one. Now, uh, you can see the way to work these things out um, in terms of understanding, it's just the number multiplied by the number four keep going down to one. So three factorial is three times by two times by one. Four factorial is four by three by two by one. In practice, though, you're going to use a calculator to work it out. Like you play out your calculator and just find the right button and bang, you got there. Would you like me to show you on a calculator what the buttons look like, where to find it? Well, if not, pull out your calculator, see if you can find it yourself. Just pull out your own calculator. What you really are looking for is something, a button which is something like X, exclamation mark, is often how they write it down. Exclamation mark. So, I want to, so for, let's just try, let's try working out 3 factorial. Put your calculus, see if you can work it out. So, just one, 3, X fact, that little exclamation mark button equals, that should give you the answer. 6. The answer is 6, yep. So, the biggest your calculator can do directly is about 69 factorial, that's about as high as it can get. After that, <coughs> it's, the numbers get a bit big. So, it does grow quite significantly. So, if you're getting that large, that you need to think of something different. Does everyone find a button on their own cap button?
So, um, how many different ways are there of, to order the letters A, B, C? Six. Six. So, and then how do you work that out? Is it three of them? Yeah, so you're just ordering the three things, so it's going to be three factorial, and therefore six is just worked out. So, what about, say you've got five people um, in a family, so you've got five in your family, you want to line them up for a photo, how many different ways are there a line them up for the photo? Um, okay, and so how do you work that out? So, there's five, different, five people, you want to order them, so five factorial is equal to 120. And so ordering things, as you can, add, the numbers jump up pretty quickly after a while. So if it was six, then we'd be 720, and it just grows and grows. So often we want to order things just like that. So factorial is about ordering stuff, but sometimes you want to order only some of them, not every single, every single thing we have an option for. That's using what's called a permutation. Again, there's formulas. You can see some formulas on the board. Again, in practice, using your calculator is quite sufficient. So you can just use calculators for it. Um, who's done permutations before? Okay, not many. Well, not many people to admit to it. Um, so it's first, so I guess there's two things. One, you have to recognise in the first place, and once you recognise it, then you can just pull your calculator to work the answer out for you. You can work at some of them without thinking, without using calculators. You can do it directly if you wanted to, but the calculator just saves a lot of work for it. So how it works, so if you've got a bunch of um, things, you've got, say, N of them, you want to pick, you want to order just a subset, say, R of them, just ordering some but not all of them. So N is the first number, that's the number of things, the big group you've got, and then you do N, P, R, and little r is the number of things you want to order. It's a button on your calculator. It really depends upon the brand where it is. Um, Casios often call it NPR, I think it is. It's up to write down. Um, sometimes they're above this multiplication divide button. Um, we'll do another one, NCR. Sometimes they're buttons by themselves. Um, so if you can't find it, I mean, ask or I can show you. Um, there is a direct formula, so if your calculator didn't, couldn't do it, um, that's effectively what the formula is on the slide there, uh, but, but as I said, it's just going to be easier to put your calculator to work it out. Um, there are special cases, so let's just think about some of these special cases. Um, NP0, so that would be the number of ways of ordering nothing if you've got a group of N. Well, if you've got nothing, there's only, only one way of ordering nothing, I guess by definition. So that's a definition one. 0P0, zero zero, number of ways of ordering nothing from nothing. It's a bit of a silly case, but we'll just define it to be one just for completeness sake. We'll just have a number there. Um, NPN was, would be the number of, well, if you've got N objects, you want to order all N of them, well, we call that N factorial a second ago. That's a number of ways of ordering N things from N. That's just the N factorial back from before. So um, let's look at some examples. So how many ways are there to line up three students from a group of five? So two different ways of doing this. One way is to go, well, I've got five different people. I want to order some of them, and so it's going to be a permutation. So it's 5P for permutation, which is another way of saying ordering. Five ordering, and you want to order just three of them. So that could be the answer straight away. Another way of thinking about it, which is how all the formulas work, is essentially a different way. I've got, I want to <coughs> order three different people. So I've got three people here. Another choice is to use this multiplication rule. How many different people can be put in the first box? Well, I've got five different people to choose from, so there'll be five ways of doing that. Each box is independent, so it's going to be multiplication. How many different people can we put in the second box? Well, we've already chosen one person. I don't know what it is yet, but we've chosen one person for the first box. Four. So we only have four people left to choose for the next box. 
How many people do we have for the next one? Three. So three. And that's the other way of doing it. So instead of thinking at permutations directly, in formulas, you can just go, it's just five times by four times by three. Um, and therefore, the answer is going to be 60. Uh, it'd be good to find your calculator, see if you can find the button in half later, which might be quicker for you. But it's good to see the both ways of doing it. So you can see it really is just an application of that multiplication principle. Can everyone find that button? Um, so you've got a um, raffle, 100 people in it, and the raffle's going to, at the end of the day, um, pick a first, second, and third prize. Um, how many different ways are there of picking these three winners from the group of 100 people? And let's assume um, that no one can get all three prizes. It's <laughs> one or the other. Two different ways of doing it. So one way is the direct way. You know, let's, how, many people, how many people can win first prize? 100. How many people can win second prize? Well, there's everybody who hasn't won first prize, so the 99 other people. How many people can win the third prize? So whoever is left, so everybody except for the first and second prize winner, so there's 98 people left. And that would be the answer. The other way of doing it, so it's either or, you don't have to do both. The other way is I've got 100 people, I would like to order three of them. So it's also equal to 100 pay three, if you want to think of it that way. And it's good to be able to handle both of them, both approaches, but you can just do one or the other in these circumstances. So in terms of assessment, um, this stuff is assessed in... Um, so the online assignment two, which really is just about calculations. So you have to type, you have to get an answer somehow, and just type the answer in, so the actual integer, rather than the. Well, you've got intermediate steps here. So just type the final answer into the um, online environment. That's pretty much how it is for assignment two. But you'll also be assessing this year exam, and you know, working would be valid at that point in time. And I, I mean, you've got choices in how to actually work it out. Okay, so um, you're trying to crack a password. It's be unethical for a brief moment, for example. Um, it's for a good cause. So <laughs> it's Hitler's Facebook account. Um, it could be a white white hat hacker, isn't it? That's the word for it. Um, so you're trying to get a password. Um, you know that people have used six different letters in it. They're only using letters. It makes make it easier for you. And they're all different. Um, how many different possible passwords are there that match that? These uppercase and lowercase? Or just... What do you want to do? Oh, no, what I said. <laughs> Whatever you said. Wouldn't that just be a six pair of six? Okay. Um, so let's make them... Um, yeah. no, letters, so it's it's just not uppercase. Let's just... Let's just, just, let's just to make it just lowercase for the moment, okay. and then we'll and then we'll consider other options in a second. So if they if it's all lowercase, the first letter can be there's 26 options for a lowercase letter. Um, 25 for the next, then 24 for the next letter, then 23, 22, 21. See, so it gets painful to write it down this way. But that's what it would be. So if you just have six different letters, that would be the number of ways of doing it. Um, it's much quicker, as you can see this time, you've got 26 lowercase letters. I would like to order six of them. So as you said, 26 P6, if they were just lowercase letters. Um, what's the number? We're good to get a numerical value for this. Um, 
165 billion. Billion. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm stupid anyway. So about 165 million is what you reckon? Yeah, I'd say that. So now people tend not to use just letters, or they're encouraged not to use user letters. They're encouraged to use um, numbers and uppercase letters as well. So if you did that, if you did alphanumeric, Then it would be um, 26 for lowercase, 26 for uppercase, which is 52, plus another 10 for digits. So there'd be 62 different digits. And special characters. So even if, before you worry about punctuation, um, which sometimes, depending on your part, so it's here at CSU, um, if I started using punctuation in my passwords, it wouldn't allow me into some of the systems, for example. Because um, the same passwords used for authentication for lots of things, some of them can't handle the punctuation. So that's what we're in, that's what I'm encouraged to do. They don't have to be. Uh, having said that, um, this here I'm assuming all the different characters are different. My passwords aren't necessarily that way. I could double up letters. It makes more options. It would um like in life when people hack passwords and stuff on websites, would they use like a program that does something similar to that? Um, people who re generally hack passwords um, use the fact that people don't pick random ones. That's how it works. So on a um, an iPad or a phone, the default is a four-digit password, for example, a PIN. Um, people are lazy and they go, oh, one, two, three, four. So if you had, to, if you had and you've only got, like on an iPad, you've got just a few goes before it locked you out. So if you just nick one, at, you just took one, two, three, four, that's your best guess by a long shot. Mm -hmm. So you use the fact of psychology. People want to use these things all the time. They don't want to waste time having to type in a fancy password. They just want to type in something easy. And so there's just not, and that's how you, that's how you hack them. It literally defeats the purpose of having a password. Yes, it does. So the other option, the other ways of doing it on a, um, so say the CSU authenticated system, um, is I mean, if you've got no any other knowledge, is people tend to use common words to using that. So how you really what really happens is when people get access to the password files or something like that, which tends to be the, the hash codes. And if you can just go, just try lots of common options for it, common options, common passwords people might use. I think with lots of common words, maybe they're only a digit at the end, or their name with a digit at the end. You just got a bunch of common options, and you try that. That's how you break those. But that requires you to have access to, a, say, in a Unix system, have access to the password file. You know, if you don't have it, I mean, well, most systems, if you try the password a few times, it blocked you out. So you'd have to have some back end. Um, but it's how you do it in reality. That requires a limited brute force, because those numbers are getting too big, which is the whole idea of it, right? So if you generally picked a random password, you've got a good protection. So the moral of the story is don't get lazy with your passwords. And so, and so good systems like CSU are pretty well authenticated, um, but some websites you use aren't. I mean, of course, they just don't have the security is a lot lax. And so your password could easily get leaked from a, a third party website quite easily. So don't use the same password there as you would in more secure environments. Um, so it's good to use lots of different right. passwords, which is annoying, I'm sure. But. And, and like, CSU is a big organisation, so people do try to hack it for identity fraud, I presume. I think that's what they really do it for. Um, and so they try to um, get into the system. People get compromised, it happens anywhere. So be the wise about it. So... Um, so it, as you can see from this counting, a genuine brute force trying all random combinations would not be feasible because the numbers just get too big way too quickly. Um, but people aren't don't pick genuine random passwords. Okay, um, different example. Guys, all thinking this one. So I've got the letters. A, B, A up to H, to make them just capitals. 
Um, so five, eight, so eight different letters. I would like to order the letters with an extra condition. I want to order them so that the letters A, B, C are in that order. So it could be the beginning, it could be the middle, it could be the end. So the way to do it is basically you've got one group, A, B, C is what of one group that's sort of locked together. It's still there and I would put it in, but I'll just put it as one. And then you've got the D, E, etc. up to H. So how many different groups do we have? Well, we have one from the ABC, that's sort of one group, and the D up to H would be everything else. Six. That would be, yeah, so that's six groups there, so seven groups all up. So pretty much we have seven different groups. Now we have our seven different groups, I want to order those, and all options are possible. So therefore we have seven groups. We want to order them. How many and how many want to order? Well seven. all seven of them. And so that's equal to seven P seven or seven factorial is probably the easiest way of writing it down. So what you're saying is correct. So the way to do these trickier things like this is just to go, well just make it into one group and then otherwise treat it like we did before. So just ordering the seven groups around. Okay, so that's permutations, and you can do those, you know, either or. The other sort of thing is called a combination. Uh, give it a context for it all. So a permutation is when you want to order things a combination is when you choose things and you do not care about order. So combination is no order, permutation has an order. That's the big difference between them. Um, they tend to be similar buttons, they similar similar location buttons in your calculator. So some of them, it's just a shift NPR, becomes the NCR, etc. Sometimes they're just next to each other. So they, they're related. Um, so it's the number of ways of choosing R things from N. So it's really about the number of choices. Um, so uh, in high school, if you've ever seen them, and, has, and therefore because your calculators are marketed at um, the school market, your calculators are the same thing, they would write it as NCR. Um, in high level maths, we tend to write it this sort of thing, it's called a binomial coefficient. If you know, you want to heard that phrase before? Uh, I think I have, yeah. So um, that's, how I, that's how I would write them. Um, and so I have to, so I mean, I'll try to use the NCR because if anyone's done, that's what you're more familiar with. And more precisely, that's what your calculator says. So we'll stick with that. But I have to think not to use the other notation. That's what I would use more normally, personally. In exam, does it matter which one you use? No. Right. Like, I can understand both, so. As with the marker, so. Um, oh, you're the marker for the exams. Damn. I mean, oh, that's probably good. Oh, I, I, I write this. I write the exam and the solutions, and the marker scheme. So you just don't mark it. I don't mark. It. Do you know who does? Yeah, I do. But I'm not telling you it is. I mean, it wouldn't know. It wouldn't mean anything to you anyhow. Do you know how much money they take? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I believe they're incorruptible. But What's what their favourite alcohol? <laughs> um, so, an example of this sort of thing is, um, let's take a set. ABC. How many subsets of size 2 are there? We'll write them down. It's, just not, it's not hard in this case. We'll just write them all down. So what are the subsets of size 2 we can have for this? So A, B is one of them. A, C, yep. B, C. Hmm? B, C. B, C. 
Is there any others? What about um, BA? Isn't that the same as AB? Yeah, so because they're sets, those are the same. So they're really, that's not really an extra option, so I should scribble it out. So for, when choosing sets, order doesn't matter, make a difference. So really the only subsets of size 2 are those three. There's just three of them. So you can see there's three subsets of size 2. So in, sh in the quick way of working out, I, mean, I don't want to have to list them all every single time, I have three different uh, elements in the first place, A, B, C, and I would like to choose two of them to form a subset. So in general, the number of ways of finding two subsets from a group of size three would be three choose two. And it's, I think this way of thinking about it in terms of sets is useful because sets really have no order, and that's what we're doing. We're choosing a subset from a group. Not choosing, the, not choosing a list, like a permutation does, just choosing a subset, just a, a group of it. Now, there are some formulas to help you work what these things are at directly, and there are some patterns you can exploit. Uh, I think what's going to be easier for you guys is just to treat it like a button in your calculator, in all honesty. Um, and now that makes it a bit of a black box, which I'm sure irritates some people, not really understanding it. But I think for the majority of people, that's just going to be the easy way of handling it. Um, there are some special cases. Let's just do them out. It just help you understand what it's about. So n, choose n. That's the number of ways of choosing. You've got a group of n, and choosing all n. Well, there's only one way of choosing everything, essentially. Therefore, n choose n would be 1. The other special case is n choose 0. That's a number of ways of choosing nothing from a group of n. I guess we'll call that one way of doing that. It seems a bit of an unusual situation, but sort of a definition will define that to be 1. Um, now, that might seem funny. It's useful to have those special cases, and your calculator knows them all. Um, it's used other special cases just to define uh, make it, make things to make sense of lots of options, essentially. Okay, so um, playing poker. In poker, um, a deck of cards that like, has 52 cards in it, that's the sort of standard deck, if you pull out the jokers. So you've got 52 different cards. A poker hand has five cards in it. How many different hands are there? Now, uh, does order matter? So if you get a, if you get if you play cards, does the order of the cards that you get dealt matter? No. So you really don't care about order. You just want to care about which group of five cards you have. So in this case, this is a choose rather than a permutation, because order doesn't matter. So the answer is well, I've got 52 cards to pick from. I would like to choose. Five of them. Now I can explain further about where the numbers come from if you want to, but I think put it in calculator and tell what the answer is would be sufficient in the case. 2,598,960. Sorry, over two million different <coughs> possible cans. Which means that that means there's lots of different games you can play. I guess that's the idea of it all. So if that number was too small, then there, then there really is not many options for the game, um, and therefore it gets boring. So you need to have that number for a game. You need to have it sufficiently big so there's lots of different options for how you when you play. That's the idea. Hmm? Um, some ga games are aimed at different markets, we'll put it that way. <laughs> um, okay. This is Lotto. Uh, so, so, how Powerball. Um, works. I think it's Phil Powerball. So, how they used to have it is they used to have two barrels. 
And they still do Powerball. I, I don't follow Lotto to tell you the truth, so I don't remember if it still works. It's still around. But, um, this is how Powerball used to work. This is one of the Lottos they used to have. They used to have two barrels. One had, they both had 45 balls in it. So from the first barrel, they picked five balls. So they just did one, two, three, four, five balls coming from that. And they're ordinary colours, essentially. Uh, and then they pick one special ball, and it was you know, glittery or something like that. To make it, and it was the power ball. Um, so they pick one ball from the second barrel. Um, and so basically, in order to win the lotto, you had to pick, you had to pick all of those six different numbers. That's how you had to win it. Or the order it comes out doesn't matter. It's just what the numbers are. So again, order doesn't matter at this point in time. How many different possible um, combinations are there from Powerball? So let's pick on the first barrel. This is the ordinary balls. Um, how many different ways are there of getting of getting the five numbers coming out from the barrel of 45 numbers? So it's really it's going to be I've got 45. I want to get five of them. So it's 45 something five. Is it a permutation or a combination? Permutation. So permutation means the order they come out matters. A combination means we don't care about the order. It's a combination. So it's a combination. So we only care about what the numbers are, not the order they come out. For the second barrel, for the power ball, how many different possible options are there for the power ball? 45. So you can think of it as just being 45, or it's equal to, I've got 45, I want to choose one of them. It is equal to 45, which is just more simply put. Now we're going to add them or multiply them or what? You just add them all. So I mean you've got two options, you've got two numbers here. So the 45 choose 5 is a bit bigger than the 45. Are um, we going to multiply those two or add them up? Get them multiplied. So you multiply them why? Because the 45 is independent on the other one. Okay, so they're independent of each other, and you want you want to have you have one choice and the other choice. It's like an and. So and so it's roughly speaking, and is multiplication or is plus. And there's a special case in Italy. So and is multiplication when it's independent. Um, so and is multiplication when it's independent, plus, so or is plus when it's um, disjoint. Yeah, the other special rules. <coughs> so you need to multiply them two together. If you don't want one or the other, you want both at the same time. And then if you put your calculator to work out what that number is. 54,979,155. What's the first few digit? Uh, 54 million. Right. So basically zero. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So what's the chance <laughs> you'll get the winning ticket? One in so the probability is one over 54 million. <laughs> it looks like a logarithm. Excuse Which is about two in 100 million. About thereabouts. Man, what are, what are the odds? It's pretty. They, they, well, that's the probability. Odds is different. Um, oh, it's just a slightly different concept. Yeah, it's 50-50. Are you going to win or you're not? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I mean... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> got it. Um, <clears throat> so, what's the chance of winning Lotto? Well, um, it's only slightly better... Uh, you've got a slightly better chance of winning Lotto if you actually enter. You mean they can win the Lotto just by like sitting here? <laughs> wow. Amazing. Amazing. So um, you don't have a great chance. I mean, so Powerball <laughs> is less likely to win than other forms of lotto because they had that second barrel, where the, that last ball is separate to the rest of them. Why they do that is because that means the jackpots get higher and higher, and that's what people why buy people buy tickets because the jackpots getting bigger. They don't care about the odds or the probability. So we don't really think about that normally. They think about how much money you can win. Everybody knows it's not likely. So people know that, but they don't quite know how unlikely it is. I reckon they should just make everyone win the lottery, because then no one will want to go in the lottery. Oh, they just make money, money from it. So, Lotto, 
a lot, lots of gambling is just a hidden tax. Really? Yeah. Now, other people make money from it, but they're often known by governments, etc. It's just another tax. So, when you get, like, two people winning the lotto... They have to share it. Yeah, so... You well, they fight to death. How, how much, like, different is it than all yeah. two in 100 million chance? Like, would it be, like, four in 100 million or what? And they both have the two in 100 million chance. The chance doesn't change if more people win it. Yeah. So, um... You, it's complicated. I'll we'll try to explain it. So, um, that's the number. That's the chance that one per that if that you enter that you get it. What's the chance that the jackpot goes off that week, right? So the chance the probability jackpot goes off that week. Let's assume everybody just picks numbers completely independent of each other. Uh, if they don't, it just becomes too complicated. So it's basically. Um, what normally happens, if it, the probability that no one wins the jackpot, since no one wins, would be one, it would be um, one minus one over 54 million. That's the chance of not winning, like right? So that, that would be, that's what would be the, that's what it would be for person number one. That's what it would be for number two and three and four. So it's that to the number of people who play the game. That probably doesn't go off. N is you know, some big number. So that's no one wins. You have one person win. Would be uh, 1 minus 154 million to the N minus 1 times by 154 million. That's a chance that one person wins. You can do two people. Same thing. Same sort of numbers. You can go other ones down. Um, if you start thinking about it, um, the 1 minus 1 over 54 million is pretty close to 1. So changing that from just getting rid of one factor that doesn't change the number drastically, the adding the 1 over 54 million changes the, the probability quite drastically. So that's a big number, um, relatively. This drops down quite a bit, and it drops even further down. So the probability of getting two people winning is unusual, but when this N starts being really big, it can certainly happen. Something, I mean, it's quite bo- it, so just be, because I left a lot of people play, the chance of those things happen is it, not as in, uncommon as you should think it to be. It's a simple answer. And it really depends on how many people are playing. So not many people are playing, yeah, Buckley's, but people, a lot of people do play these things, and that's why they get from. So.